Hi, my name is Dr. Daniel Sohn. Um, thanks for coming today on uh, such a nice day. Um, thanks for taking time out to um, come to our little discussion here about shoulder pain, uh, chronic uh, shoulder pain issues. Uh, I just want to make this an open opportunity so that if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, it's sort of at the end of this whole thing, I sort of want you to have a, um, a much more uh, appreciation of shoulder pain, shoulder issues, and be able to sort of speak intelligibly about uh, issues of the shoulder and some of the treatment modalities that are available. I want to make it concise, so we're going to talk about four different things. Um, a little bit about myself in terms of uh, housekeeping. I uh, grew up in Chicago. I uh, attended the University of Chicago Medical School and I went to, trained at the University of Michigan. I met my wife there. I uh, moved over to the west side of the state and I've been practicing here for the last 17 years. Uh, I have uh, three children, uh, two of whom play hockey and I have two kids in high school now. So we're really integrated in the community and we love this area as, as you do too. Uh, I see patients at Lakeland Medical Center in St. Joseph, but also in Niles on Friday uh, afternoons. So let's get right to it. Shoulder pain. Shoulder pain uh, is a very common issue that we have during the course of our life. And I want to talk about four specific things about shoulder pain. Now this is not going to cover everything, but I look around us and in the age group that we're all in, uh, I think this will cover pretty much 95% of it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about shoulder impingement, uh, rotator cuff tears, shoulder arthritis, rotator cuff arthropathy. Um, I'm going to talk about how to diagnose it. I'm going to talk about treatment modalities, both surgical and non-surgical. Uh, non-surgical treatment is something we're going to be, is, is the hallmark of treatment. And operative interventions such as arthroscopy and different types of shoulder replacement are something I'm going to touch upon as well. In order to understand shoulder pain, you have to understand shoulder anatomy. Shoulder anatomy, shoulder is a ball and socket joint uh, made up of the humerus, and which is attached to the humeral head, which makes up the ball component. This is attached to the socket. The socket is part of the scapula. We call that the glenoid. The glenoid is sort of like the golf ball and the tee, the ball being the humerus, humeral head, and then the T being the glenoid. Attached to the scapula are the acromion, which is attached to your collarbone. So you sort of think about the acromion as like the shoulder pad of your shoulder. The sh shoulder is a ball and socket joint. It's a wonderful joint because it allows for abduction, forward flexion, retraction, internal and external range of motion. So it allows for many degrees of freedom. But because it has so much freedom, it's like a golf ball sitting on a tee, and anyone who knows about golf, uh, the ball frequently falls off. So basically, it's like the shoulder is a ball that's being balanced. And what balances the shoulder? It's the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff confers stability and also motion to the, rotator, to the shoulder. In the shoulder, you basically have one muscle on top of the shoulder. That muscle is called the supraspinatus, on top. There's a muscle in front, so the subscapularis, and two muscles in the back. So one on top, one in the front, front, and two in the back. The one that frequently causes most problems is the supraspinatus, because the supraspinatus has to go above the glenoid and, and inserts on the lateral aspect of the shoulder. And this is what holds onto the shoulder, but also when the supraspinatus fires, it allows you to lift your shoulder away from your body. So, to, re to review, the supraspinatus comes from the scapula, goes underneath the acromion, but above the humeral head and attaches laterally. And so it's sort of like you're making a tendon sandwich between two pieces of bone. So it's a very vulnerable, it's in a very vulnerable position. Then above the rotator cuff is a bursa. The bursa is a, a structure that allows pr to protect the tendon from constant wear against the uh, acromion up above, and that's a word that we're going to um, uh, discuss in just one second. So the shoulder is a ball, and you have four muscles coming in and holding it and balancing it. So we're going to talk about the common diagnoses. The most common one is the rotator cuff impingement, rotator cuff tendonitis, and rotator cuff bursitis. Now, we talked about the tendon, so you understand the tendonitis. 
bursitis. We talked about the bursa. That's the protective sort of film membrane. It's sort of like a Ziploc bag that protects the bone, protects the tendon from the bone up above. And impingement. That's when you have the bone actually rubbing on the tendon. But three of those terms are used pretty synonymously. So I'm going to basically talk, call it impingement, but I'm talking about all three things. So it is the inflammation of the rotator cuff tendons and bursa, which causes tendonitis. And sometimes it's a mechanical impingement. Actually, the bone will physically rub against the tendon and sometimes cause tears. So shoulder symptoms. When patients present, they'll say, I have pain. I have pain with overhead motion. I have pain and sometimes weakness. I have difficulty lifting my arm. You have pain with activity, but also sometimes pain at night and with rest. Some people will experience stiffness and lack of range of motion due to discomfort and pain. So when you see a doctor, one of the first things he's going to do is get an x-ray. And this is a normal looking x-ray. Once again, here's the humeral head, the glenoid, and the acromion. What you want to see is that little bump right there. Can you see a rotator cuff tear um, or tendonitis on an x-ray? You actually can't. Uh, but you want to make sure there's a little bump right there and there's not a big spur on the end of that uh, acromion. So when the next thing that your doctor is going to do is he's going to do a physical exam. What's he going to do? He's going to look at your body posture. Do you slouch a lot? Do you roll your shoulders in? What do you do for work? Do you work at a desk and you roll your shoulders in and you constantly protract your shoulders? Because um, that is a, an issue that can cause uh, impingement. Range of motion, both actively as well as passively. How well can you move it, and how well can I move it? How, much, how good is your strength? Do you have tenderness around the shoulder? In general, most people will say, I, some people, most people with rotator cuff tendonitis will say that it hurts on the outside of the shoulder. Some people will point to this spot right up here. Okay? But if some people complain about up here, that sometimes could be a neck issue. So you want to separate out neck issues from shoulder issues. So the next thing he'll do is, uh, or he or she'll do, uh, is do provocative testing. That's when he holds your arm and moves your arm and tries to elicit discomfort, pain, or instability. So this is a common test called the Hawkins test. What we're trying to do is get that ball to rub against the acromion. And if there's irritation, inflammation, you'll say, ouch. This is the nearest test. So if you have one of those things, we start thinking, maybe you have some a rotator cuff tendonitis or a rotator cuff tear. So it, infl inflammation of the bursa, overuse can develop tendonitis, and a small tear can cause inflammation and pain. Remember, tears, small tears, micro tears, your body wants to repair. How does it repair? Through inflammation. So inflammation can mean small micro tears of the tendon. Pain is derived from inflammation of the tendons of the rotator cuff and also inflammation of the bursa. It can become from, come from small microscopic tears. It was discovered in the 1800s. Uh, it's one of the most common causes of shoulder pain and instability. And disease severity ranges from just inflammation to, and swelling to irreparable ruptures. Incidence is 5 to 50, 40%, meaning that every year your chance of getting it could be 5 to 40%. In other words, as you get older, it actually starts going up. It's a normal process of aging. And in 65-year-olds, even 65-year-olds that are asymptomatic, 50% of them will have some kind of type of tear. And when you get to 80, 80% 80 might have some type of tear. That doesn't mean you have symptoms. That just means that you have a presence of a tear. So I always explain to people, it's sort of like a rope, because the tendons are sort of built like cables, like cables, like a Golden Gate Bridge cables, but also it's like a pair of blue jeans. So when, you get a, when you're born, you get a brand new pair of blue jeans. It's nice and blue, and the fabric's really thick. And as you use it, maybe in your 30s and 40s, it starts wearing a little bit. And then when you get a little older, you do this. Uh, sometimes you can get it from trauma as well. But for the most part, tendonitis comes from wear and tear. It's an attritional problem. Why do you get tears? This is a slide that shows the vascularity of the humeral head, the glenoid, and also the rotator cuff right there. When, what they've done is they've injected gel and plasticized gel into the vascular system. And what you see is the blood vessel comes in from this way and stops right about there. You see that? 
blood vessel comes in and stops right about there, right there. So when you tear something, it doesn't have a great blood supply to heal. So it's like that part of your lawn that doesn't get a good, blood, a good water supply. It sort of turns brown after a hot summer. And also you can see that the blood vessels further on the bursal side, I'm going to call this the bursal side, as opposed to the intraarticular side. You see, the blood vessels are more prominent here than here. That means that you have a higher chance of tearing intraarticularly than on the bursal side. That's why smoking is so bad. When you smoke, you cut off that blood supply even more. So this part here is vulnerable to wear and tear. So you come in, you tell me all those issues, I look at your x-rays and I say, we're going to start treatment. And what are the modes of treatment that we're going to start with? We're going to start with non-operative treatment. We're going to do physical therapy. I'm going to ask you to rest and not do those crazy lifting exercises that you've been doing at the gym. Um, I'm going to maybe prescribe medicines such as aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, any kind of anti-inflammatory medicine. And I'm going to also offer you injection. Physical therapy is very effective. Uh, there's three modalities of physical therapy. Um, basically, we try to get your range of motion back, get you back to strength, and then we ask you to go back to your normal sporting activity and your hobbies. Subacrobial injections are also very helpful. Um, they benefit by reducing pain and increasing range of motion. So in essence, I tell people, I give you injections so you can do the therapy. It's for the therapy that really helps you. Some people come in, they can't even move their shoulders so that they can't even benefit from therapy. That's when I offer an injection. Shoulder injections are given usually from the back, but you can get it from the front or the side. And it's given right into the bursa. Conservative treatment is very successful. You can get up to about 50 to 95% of improvement just with conservative treatement. Some, some, literature, uh, some literature says that it's 33 to 92%. Basically, this is what it boils down to. If you are about 30 years old and you have tendonitis and you do physical therapy and maybe get an injection, you have a 95% chance you'll get better. But as you reach 65, that number drops to about 50%. So 50% of patients will do well and go on with their lives but about 50% uh, might require some type of surgery. So you do the therapy, you maybe get a shot, and you, I ask you to come back in six weeks, a month or six weeks. And then you say, I'm either better or I'm not better. If you're not better, I order an MRI. An MRI is a test that allows us to see the rotator cuff and also see the other pathology too. So here's what a typical MRI might look like. This is the ball, this is the cup, and here is the rotator cuff tendon sitting on the bone. And this part is the rotator cuff attach attachment. You see how that's wide? We call that the footprint. That's the footprint of the rotator cuff. Now here is somebody, this is not an MRI, it's an MRA. This person had got a dye injection, okay? And why do you get this? Eh, it just gives you more detailed anatomy and we need to see some stuff inside the shoulder, we get an MRA instead of an MRI. So this, ten, this is the rotator cuff, and instead of sitting here, it's pulled away. The shoulder is riding a little bit higher. You see that? The center of the ball is right there, and the center of the cup's right here. I think it's riding a little higher. And we're going to talk about this in, sec in a second, but when you tear a rotator cuff tendon and you let it sit around for a long time, the shoulder is no longer being grabbed by that claw. The top part of the claw is broken off, right? So what happens? The next strongest muscle takes over. What's the next strongest muscle? It's your deltoid muscle. So it pulls your shoulder up. So that's what you see in somebody who's had a long-standing rotator cuff tear. So surgical treatment. So now we got an MRI. It doesn't show a tear because you have tendonitis. Um, what do we do? We, I do an exploration, the breed mount. I clean out the tendon and I do a subacromial decompression. I clean out the bone spurs. That's what the colloquial, that's what people usually call that. And then I also look at the biceps, but we're not gonna talk about the biceps today because that's a, another topic. So what is arthroscopy sort of, what, do I, what am I doing during arthroscopy? This is supposed to be a picture of a room. Arthroscopy is I make a poke hole on the back of the shoulder and I put, introduce a camera. And when I introduce the camera into your shoulder, it's like walking into a room. 
from the back. When I look straight ahead, what do I see? I see the subscapularis tendon. When I look up above, I see the ceiling tile. That's the rotator, that's the supraspinatus tendon. Then I look behind me, I see the infraspinatus and the teres minor. On the right or left, depending on we're doing a, whether or not we're doing a right or left shoulder, you see the ball and the cup. So what I'm looking around for is how are the moldings around the edges? How is the ceiling tile? Are there holes in the ceiling tile? Does your shoulder look like this where there's no holes anywhere, or does it look like this where there's a hole right there? Okay. So when there's a hole, I check to see how bad the hole is by going above the ceiling tile. So this is a picture of an arthroscopy. This is that ball of the shoulder, and here's the rotator cuff, and here's the biceps tendon. This is the supraspinatus tendon. I check that edge to make sure it looks good. This is one that does not look as good. You see the bicep tendons right there? There's a little inflammation and irritation right there. Here's the ball, and here's a little device I'm using to uh, open up and show that there's a partial tear of the rotator cuff. After you do that, I go above the ceiling tile and I look down on the rotator cuff and I also look straight ahead to the acromion. People say we have three different types of acromion. Dr. Bill Gianni says that. He, well, we have a flat acromion, some people have curved acromions, and something, some people really have cr uh, hooked acromions. These are associated with more mechanical type of impingement. So what we do is we use a camera here, and we make another incision, and I use a little burr to shave out the hook. So I flatten out the bone spur to take away the mechanical impingement. So what do we do about the partial tears? Let's say I look up in the ceiling tile, and eh, it's not perfect, but there's a, it doesn't look like there's a hole there. You don't, can't look into the undersurface of the roof. Sometimes there's a partial tear. Sometimes it's intraarticular. Sometimes it's in the bursal side. Remember I told you with that slide that shows the vascularity, which is more common? The one that's out here on the bursal side or the one that's out here on the articular side? Articular tears are more common. Partial tears on the articular side are more common. Anyway, that's part of the debris mod. I debride this. So I look at it and I say, zero, no tears. 30% tears, zero to 30, I clean it out. If it's 30 to 50, sometimes I have to put a little tack in it hold it together. If it's about 50%, I cut it, I complete the tear, and I fix it like it's a rotator cuff tear, like a full rotator cuff tear. So let's talk about rotator cuff tears. So as time goes on, the little tears go, get bigger and bigger and bigger, and one day you fall on it or nothing even happens, and you start having a tear, and you start having symptoms. So 50% of all 65-year-olds have some type of tear, 80% of all 80-year-olds who even have no symptoms have some type of tear. It's a common feature of degeneration, and surgery is only for pa patients who have pain and have failed conservative treatment. So it's like a pair of blue jeans. You start like that, it goes like that, then you sit down and squat, and it turns into that. So non-operative treatment, we still start with non-operative treatment for the most part. Physical therapy, medications, injections, rest, activity modification. And sometimes, in those, uh, if it's a big tear, it doesn't get, you know, it's, it doesn't improve, still have a lot of functional impairment, then we could select surgery. We, patient selection is very important. You'd like patients to be younger than, physiologically younger than 60. Um, and um, so basically, people have to go through about six weeks of physical therapy uh, prior to doing any uh, surgery. So the poor prognostic, prognostic factors are older age group, long history of problems, no uh, history of trauma. In other words, you didn't fall on it. It's just sort of, you just got it. You just start getting worse and you get an MRI and there's a big hole there. Uh, smokers have to do poorly. People who've had multiple steroid injections and people who have a lot of our, uh, weakness in their bones. Why do the patients who have the long history uh, have problems? Because when you have a tear in the tendon and it's been there for a long, long time, I can't sometimes pull it down. There's a couple of things I can't do. Number one, when there's a tendon, I try to pull it back down to the bone. It's like one of these uh, window shades that you try to pull down, right? But when it's been stuck up there for years, you can't pull it down. I got a couple of tricks I can use, but if I can't pull it down, it's gonna be very difficult to fix. Number two, if I put a stitch in there and it doesn't hold, then it's very hard to hard to fix. I've got patches and stuff, but patches don't work that great. 
Number three, I can't make things heal. So after therapy, you have to be very compliant with the restrictions and actually let the body heal itself. And also, if you're a smoker uh, and things like that, it, it'll tend not to have a, the best result. So how do we do the surgery? Once again, you have, this is for rotator cuff tear. You still, you still do the rotator subacromial decompression. That's goal one. Goal two is to do the repair. Uh, repair the rotator cuff. Assess the nature of the tear. How are these tears? How do these tears look like? Is it an L-shaped tear, U-shaped tear? Uh, can I move the tendon? Remember, sometimes it's like a, it's stuck up there and I can't move it. Can I release the adhesion so that I can move it? Um, then I do a, a release the coracohemoral ligament, um, and that's okay. There are three types of repairs. The open repair is probably, you know, it's, the old, it's been around the longest. You actually make an incision and you get down visually to do the acromioplasty under direct vision, and then you fix the rotator cuff under direct vision. Uh, the arthroscopic technique is doing everything through, through poles, tiny little holes. The mini open technique is you do the arthroscopy to do the decompression, and then you make a small incision to fix the rotator cuff. Um, there's advantages to doing an open repair. It's easy to do. You don't need any special equipment, and it's been around for a long time. So this is the way you do an open repair. You make an incision um, in the front of the shoulder. We'll clean out the bursa like this. We tag the tendon, and then we sew it back down to the bone right there. The rotator cuff repair, this is sort of like you grab the tendon with suture, and you sew it onto the bone. You see how this is sewn on to one spot? That's called a single row repair. And I want to talk, a, well, I'm going to talk about single row versus double row. Single row is like this. You get the tendon and you put it on the bone like that. You get the tendon and you put it on the bone like that. A double row is you're reestablishing the footprint. You put a row of, tendon, row of uh, anchors on the inside of the bone and a row of, on the outside. So you have a bigger footprint so it heals. Uh, it does better for the bigger tears. So here's a picture of a rotator cuff arthroscopy. Here's the tear. Here's the tendon. There's a, you see how there's a gap there? This is the exposed bone. We go in there and put stitches in there like so, and then we sew it back down like that. There's another view of it. This is a single row. This is a double row. I pretty much exclusively do double rows now. The advantages of arthroscopic repair is that there's less morbidity because you have less, less incisions, so you can heal faster. It's truly outpatient surgery. You can address other problems because you've got, you got a camera inside your shoulder and you can see everything and allows you to draw, address small tears that in the past you probably couldn't even see and appreciate. So here is a little video of how we do arthroscopic surgery. So you poke, you put a couple um, holes in the shoulder and then you use these portals. These portals are like uh, tunnels that you go use to approach this rotator cuff. There's the rotator cuff tear. We mobilize the tear. Then we say, I can mobilize this. I can think I can fix this one. Then we clean out the bone, create a nice bleeding bed. And then I punch a little hole into the medial row. Then I put an anchor. These are like harpoons. You put a, this anchor in, screw it into the bone. That's why your bone should be, it's better if it's harder. Um, and you release that. You grab the suture. You use a special machine that punctures through the rotator cuff, and that, and you pass that suture through there. Then you do it a second time. Oh. Then you do a second time, right here. So you got two sutures coming through here, and you have two anchors on the medial row. So I told you you guys can do this after watching this video. Because <laughs> they go through every single step. Uh, then, you get the, then you get another anchor here on the lateral row, and then this anchor pulls on this and tightens everything down. So you're reestablishing the natural footprint as best we can. Why did it stop? Oh, that's good. 
Uh, Post-operatively, you know, how you progress depends on how big the tear was, how difficult it was to repair, uh, how much retraction there was, and how much limitations of range of motion you had. Uh, so post-operatively, arthroscopic surgery, you can move them a lot faster, and most people return to pretty much full function in four to six months. It takes a while to get the strength back, but we try to, we tell you probably about four to six months, you'll be pretty much uh, on your way to improvement. But open surgery takes a little, couple months more. Uh, physical therapy. Uh, okay, let's talk about shoulder arthritis. Shoulder arthritis. This is a shoulder x-ray. So let's go back to thinking about when you went to see the doctor, he got an x-ray and he saw this x-ray versus this x-ray. This x-ray, he's thinking rotator cuff tear or tendonitis. This x-ray, he sees, oh my goodness, you got arthritis. So you see how the space between this bone and this bone is maintained on this side, but over here, nothing. You see that? Okay. But you still have space over here, but this is gone. So what is arthritis? Arthritis is when you lose the articular cartilage of the shoulder. The articular cartilage is like a coconut meat. It looks like coconut meat, you know? Nice and smooth and white. And then when you wear that away, you go from this to this. And then you get bone spurs developing there. So how do you treat that? You just do the same thing. Physical therapy sometimes. It doesn't help that much. But non anti-inflammatory medications and steroid injections. You don't inject into the bursa. Now we inject into the shoulder straight into the shoulder. And if that doesn't work, and you still have pain, we consider one of these options. Total shoulder replacement and reverse total shoulder replacement. This is a total shoulder replacement. So when you do a shoulder replacement, I'm gonna show you a video on how this is done, uh, so you can do it at home. But uh, this, is, this is the ball. You cut the ball off, and then you replace it with a ball, and then you put the stem down. It's like. The stem goes down the hollowness of the bone and you put a new ball on. And then the cup, you shave away the cup and you put a new plastic cup in. This is a reverse shoulder replacement. This one, instead of cutting off the ball and then replacing with a ball, you cut off the ball and you replace it with a cup. And this one, you cut away the cup and instead of replacing the cup with a cup, you replace the cup with a ball. The reason why we do this versus this is because this one is a little more, is, if you have rotator cuff tears, you cannot get this procedure. If you get, the, if you get this procedure, it'll dislocate. This is what you get when you have a rotator cuff tear on top of arthritis. So how do we do that? We cut away the ball, clean out the shaft, clean out the cup, make holes in the cup, put this a metal stem down the uh, arm bone, the humerus, uh, and then you put a new cup on, put a new ball on, and then you put your shoulder back in. This is why a rotator cuff, if you have a shoulder replacement and you tear your rotator cuff, look what happened to this one. See how it rises higher? This is supposed to be down here, right? This is the center of the cup. This is the center, of, it should be the center of the cup ball, but the ball is riding higher because this person had a rotator cuff tear. So about 15 years ago, you didn't have this option. This is all you can get. But now, if you have arthritis and you have a rotator cuff tear, you get this. So this one, you don't need a rotator cuff because the shoulder is stabilized by the natural, by the, the biomechanics of the implant. So what that's done for us is now, you have a bad car accident or you fall and your shoulder's in a bunch of different pieces, you can get this and you don't need a rotator cuff. So it's a really great operation. So what's rotator cuff arthropathy? That's when you come in, this is a normal looking x-ray once again, and this is rotator cuff arthropathy. See how the center of the cup's right here? The center of the ball is way up here. It's supposed to be down here. Why? Because we tore the supraspinatus tendon or one of the rotator cuff tendons. So the ball rides higher because the deltoid, the muscle on the outside, is pulling it up. So we do a reverse total shoulder replacement. What's the hardest part about doing a shoulder replacement? Number one, it's the exposure. But number two, how do you put the pin in? I'm going to show you the video that shows you what the pin's about. But this here is the cup. On most people, it's the size of a half dollar, maybe a dollar, silver dollar. So it's not that big. So when you expose someone's shoulder and you say, OK, I want to put the pin to start the operation right there. Well, that's fine. That looks pretty good. But what if your shoulder is sort of funny shaped, you know? 
that it's not, nobody's shoulder is absolutely perfect. So some people's shoulders are retroverted, it's externally rotated, so, the, so the, it's like a golf tee. Instead of coming out straight away, it comes a little bit for backwards. That's, re, that's a retroverted cup. And then, or some people are a little bit turned in like that. That's an antiverted cup. And some people are worn away on top, worn away on the bottom. So when you put the initial pin in, it could be any, you know, any, any number of degrees of freedom. So what we started doing is, when you look at somebody who got a total shoulder replacement or a reverse total shoulder replacement, the pin placement is, sort of looks like a shotgun blast. There's, you know, if, you, if you graph it, it could be all different positions and all different angles. Well, everyone started getting CT scans. And CT scans are nice because CT scans tell you, oh yeah, I want to be right in the center here and I want to sort of aim that way. But even when you did that and you graphed the positions, it still was sort of a, a, a wide uh, dispersion of points. So what I've been doing is, uh, and some of the other doctors have uh, been doing, is I've been doing computer navigated uh, shoulder replacement. And what that does is, here is somebody who has a shoulder that's a little bit retroverted. So if you followed the natural plane of the shoulder, this thing would be pointed that way, you see? And then you'd bust out through this part of the bone. And the problem with the shoulder replacement is you only got one chance to do it right. With the knee replacement, hip replacement, you know, after it wears out, you can get another one, right? And sometimes a third one. But with a shoulder replacement, um, you really need to put these in perfectly the first time because there's not a lot of bone. This thing is a very, very thin sliver of bone. And over here, this is like a, almost like a potato chip over here. So this bone has no purchase over here. So what this computer program does is that it tells you, okay, you want to be right here, and not only that, you want to aim right that way. So this is a uh, computer planning model, and it tells you how to put it in. So during surgery, what do you use? Well. You get a CT scan, we send it off to the company, and then they give you a model of your glenoid. And then they give you a model of how you place this thing onto the, your glenoid during surgery so you can fire a pin directly down the center. So here is one of those models. We use uh, a company called Biomet. Uh, th there's two pin placements. This is for a total shoulder and this is for a reverse shoulder. And so you don't have to use some of these guides like this one. Um, and, I'm, and this is another view of it. And I'm going to show you a little video because uh, I like videos. So this is a rather long video. I'm going to shorten it up. So basically what you do is you find a center hole of the humerus. And then you clean out the center. And this is for a reverse shoulder replacement. Then you attach this jig. Then you shave off the ball. Then um, we approach the glenoid now. The glenoid looks like this. We put a guide on it, and this is the center pin I told you about. That center pin is how you establish everything else around. So that's very important, and the navigation, the computer-generated uh, models are very helpful in doing that. So that with that center pin, you dr drill a hole, then you clean out the cup. Then after you clean out the cup, you clean out the edge, and then you put in a metal backing on the glenoid. And you lock in screws to hold that glenoid in place. Cleaning, more cleaning out of the edge. And then you put a trial ball in. Then you put a stem down the humeral shaft. Okay, then you test it. You put the new cup in and you test it. And you find the size that fits. Then you put the final implants in and then you're done.
about uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, there's a lot more steps in this one, uh, but you know, like I say, uh, I use that, uh, the signature system, which is this system right here. Once you make the incision, once you get the exposure, uh, it takes a lot of the guesswork on it. Um, I put the pin in, and once I put the pin in, it's, it's pretty fast. And uh, Yeah. You said a shoulder is a one-shot deal. A shoulder is a one-shot deal. And you might say, hey, well, you just told us that a reverse shoulder is so good for so much stuff. Why do we ever do a regular shoulder replacement? Why don't we all get reverse shoulders? That's because when you look at the regular shoulder replacement, and I'm going to answer your question with this, in this way, um, that is when you get a regular shoulder replacement, there's a lot more sloppiness to it. You see? There's a lot more... See how the ball here is not super conformed to the cup? So there's a little bit of slop, uh, sloppiness to it, a little bit of um, motion there, okay? What that does is that if you're using your arm to, you know, you're not really supposed to do this, but like, you know, uh, dig you know, ditches or something, that vibration from that impact is transmitted through your arm, but it doesn't really go into the shoulder. It gets dissipated by the muscles and stuff because it's held together by the muscles, the, the rotator cuff and deltoid, right? So the vibrations don't impact the metal bone interface and the, nor the plastic bone interface. Whereas when you look at a reverse total shoulder replacement, you've got the metal component that's attached to the bone and then you have this bone, metal component that's attached to the bone and then this thing is so highly conformed, okay, that when you use it a lot, it can, that vibration can cause loosening over time. So how long do they last? They've been around for 15 years. They have a great track record. People do really well with them. But I don't exactly, I mean, it's about 10 to 15 years, we say. We say it's about 10 to 15 years. And they sort of loosen up with time, even though, you know, these are modern metals that are really designed to grow, allow the bone to grow into them. And as you can see, nowadays, we don't use much cement at all. These are all just press fit. <laughs>